Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with my co-host, Sanjeev Mohan. Paul Gillen will also be here tomorrow. This is theCUBE's eighth year covering the 18th annual CDOIQ event. It used to be the, at the MIT, it used to be associated with MIT. Now it's sort of broken off on its own and skyrocketing. Raj Joseph is here. He's the founder and CEO of dqlabs.ai. Raj, great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Uh, fresh for, off the red eye from <laughs> LAX. Fresh. Love it. I, I, I wouldn't quite call it as fresh, yeah. but I'm there hanging in. Oh, good but, man. But thanks know? for having me, and uh, pleasure meeting you again. Yeah, no Sunday. napping on the cube, yeah. no, by the way. No, oh yeah, <laughs> like with all these lights, no, not happening. Okay, first question, why did you found the company? Um, I have a heavy uh, background in data, and uh, so even from day one as an engineer, I started building data platforms. Uh, and I was, uh, all, all through my career, I was either being a data engineering or product management or dealing with data in terms of building. And one of the companies was Axiom. Yeah. So I built the data platform. And uh, going through all this process, uh, everywhere I go, data quality was keeping on recurring. And uh, even though it was recurring, there was not a quite a clear solution that was uh, unfolding. So we were kind of bits and pieces put together. So then uh, I come like 2020, then we had this opportunity with a client which was kind of trying to do a solution around it and then uh, found an opportunity and then saw like, okay, why don't we create a solution that the problem has not been solved for well over a couple of decades. So that's kind of the uh, passion and the reason behind it. Right, that's, so that makes sense. That's kind of your, your why. We always talk about yeah. the why. Yeah. So how, you know, what's unique about what you guys yeah. do? What's your secret sauce? How do you yeah. approach it? I think, uh, so, so if you have been so watching the industry uh, for the last 30 years or so, I think uh, traditionally it has been, data quality has been a business problem. Hmm. And it's been transforming in the last two decades or the last decade or two decades with the growth in data more an engineering problem. And I think we are in a fascinating space where data is the fuel for AI, and you have these two different perspectives of school of thoughts, and I kind of feel like you need both of these perspectives, have a balance of shift left and shift right, and that's where we kind of position as a differentiation. So we are a, DQ Labs is a uh, SaaS platform, a platform that kind of provides both this ability to see both from a business standpoint as well as from an engineering perspective standpoint, so. How do you automate to the extent that you can data quality? Uh, I mean, tough question, <laughs> uh, because the data quality in itself, when you talk to different folks, have different uh, beliefs about quality. Like, I mean, Sanjay, if I ask you, you would say like a different version than mm -hmm. what you may say, David. So I think the problem starts from there. So so I don't try to see that we have to solve 100% of the problem, and that's it's a never-ending goal of sort. Uh, but what we do look into it is uh, from a personal standpoint, if I'm a data engineer, what am I really trying to solve? If I'm a business user, if if I'm a data steward and try to see the cover the uh, miles from that aspect of it. And there we have been very successful uh, because there is always a percentage of piece that we can never solve. And I don't think it's worth going for that, but if we can sever 80 percentage of the issues with the focus on 20, I think that's a great win. That's Th where we There's focused. also, when we say automation, because there are two sides of the coin. One side is observing the data yeah. to infer if there is a any quality. Yep. The quality may, data quality may not be apparent, but just yeah. applying some intelligence. Yeah. That you can automate to some extent. But then there's the other side of the coin, which is remediating mm -hmm. and fixing it. That is very hard yeah. to automate. True, and uh, I think we have this uh, four steps in the process. I think uh, for me, a product is not a just product without a framework or a process thought through it. So in DQ Labs, we preach, uh, preach the four steps, which is observe, measure, discover, remediate. Uh, Subserve is to your point, uh, can we observe the whole ecosystem in a uh, vast way, uh, which is purely based on automation hmm. and uh, alerting. But then the measure is the component where, how do you know the data that you are using is fit for purpose? And that's where the question comes, like mm. not everyone sees the data as fed because uh, today I'm building a simulation model which is very different than a GNA requirement, which is very different than a BA reporting analytics. So the fit for purpose changes, but giving that decentralized notion of uh, measurement is critical, so that is the second step. But doing observe and measure uh, mindlessly without any context 
then kind of breaks it. And that's where the semantics comes in, which is where the discover is. Uh, putting a context, putting a meaning to the data, and then applying some of this automation makes it much more intelligent versus just going uh, haywire ever, everywhere. Also, when you observe, it depends how deep of yeah. an introspection you're doing, right? Because I see there are three layers of, of people observing. You can either observe a log, yeah. And in the log, you get more coarse grained. Yep. You can observe the metadata, and you get a little bit deeper. Or you can go to the cell level. Yeah. And but the moment you go to the cell level, you're actually asking SQL kind of. Yeah, more like uh, the content. Yeah, and, the uh, content. Data distribution. And, and now you're putting more load. The cost can go up. Like if it's Snowflake, and you're asking these queries. So yeah. how does DQ Lab? No, I agree. That's a good, uh, great question. I think uh, uh, because uh, if you go too deep, your cost goes up. Correct. If you go too shallow, then you're not providing the value. And so I think uh, we start with uh, more a shallow approach immediately out of the box because the first thing you want to see any customer is a high bill price on day one. So we just uh, kind of take this crawl, walk, run approach hmm. and then uh, start off with a shallow mode out of the box. Hmm. But immediately using the log information, hmm. we will be able to identify the criticality of the data assets, I got it. right? Like there are some data which is more consumptions, more uh, data which is in the warehouse, which is very critical or important, hmm. while there are some data which is just hanging in there. Hmm. So doing a more deeper analysis for a table that is just hanging in there doesn't make any sense at all. Hmm. So that's where your metadata comes in. Some of this information that you may have in a catalog also makes sense. Uh, how much of this information is used and the consumption side becomes critical factor in decision. Uh, so these all put together becomes a uh, mm. glue in terms of the decision making process, but then it also makes like how much of this automation can be really automated without the user uh, feedback of sort. So that's where it kind of becomes a little bit great. And Raja, you're saying that you could selectively go to that fine-grained yep. detail? Yep. So you've got intelligence to allow you to yep. do that, that you're inferring from yep. metadata and, yep. and log data. Exactly. But I want to come back to observe, measure, discover, yep. and remediate. Remediate. So are these features of your platform? Are you an observability, is it observability a feature of your platform? Uh, uh, your uh, ability to measure and discover, do you, did you build a semantic layer? Yeah, uh, we do have a semantic layer. Uh, okay. and, uh, that, that is a differentiation between any of the other platforms in it. Uh, I strongly believe uh, without the context, and this is a huge topic that's going to go even more traction with the AA, with the Gen AA and the LLMs going on. Uh, uh, semantics is a uh, bigger uh, uh, area of growth that I will think we will see. And I think because the amount of data that we are producing is enormous and ginormous. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, without semantics layer, um, there is nothing that we can do meaningfully. So, so, so that's where we build the semantic layers. And then uh, to answer your question on observe, measure, discover, remediate, that is just a framework and a process that we preach. Uh, but the platform has modules on observability as well as in quality. And the users can, or the organizations, depending upon the size of the organization. If I'm a small, uh, medium organization, very engineering focused, the data is very organic. I don't have any partners data. I don't have multiple SAP, CRMs, uh, ERP systems, and it's just like one or two uh, traditional uh, data bars, Snowflake, things like that. Then they don't need more of this business side measurement because data quality is uh, not that critical, but what is more critical is data operations, data ops. And so there you can see the uh, application of observe, discover, remediate versus observe, measure, discover, remediate, right? But in the other same, the, a large enterprise has both of these challenges. You have lots of data coming from different places you need to observe and monitor from a data operation standpoint. And then also the business, when you're creating different data products, you need to be able to measure and put a uh, quality seal on top of it. Then you may employ, implement the four. So it's based on the size and different factors, but the platform gives all these modules and features. So you'll work with observability platforms, for example, and ingest that data, or? No, we or do or have the, do plat the, the okay, platform. So we we compete with, your, yeah, we yeah. compete with observability platforms. Yeah. Uh, so oh, we oh. are an observability platform and a quality platform. So that convergence is the difference of something. Got it. And then and then the remediation piece is the holy grail. Yep. So uh, you know that notion of a, a system of agency or agentic AI yep. that we're yep. not there yet. Yep. But is that part of the roadmap or the vision? No, I, I think uh, so so my notion of that is uh, since we are monitoring, observing, measuring all this data, we know what is wrong, what went wrong and what should be the right value. 
So if you can give that information to a pipeline and uh, trigger those workflows, uh, then you are kind of solving the end piece of that. So today what we do is we have uh, specific triggers to specific uh, like DBT airflows and things like that, but we have not done across all the pipelines, but that is kind of the goal of sort. So we're kind of like on the progression towards that end goal of uh, doing an end-to-end -end data lifecycle of fixing hmm. the problem. Uh, and the problem fixing is uh, challenging because sometimes it's at the field, sometimes it could be at the source level. So this is where it kind of gets a little tricky, but I think our goal is to give that information to a dump pli pipeline, yeah. which could then become a smarter pipeline. Because the, uh, the data quality could be in the mainframe. Yep. So you cannot just cannot go, go and change go the yep. mainframe. Yep. You know, that's a but very if I provide this yeah. information to yes, the data to the engineering right. team, Correct. and then they could do yep. what needs to be done. Correct. And the information is what makes it a little bit more powerful, yes. just like in anything else. Correct. The automation could be done in their tool stack by engineers or whatever they need to do. Okay, but the, but the AI can certainly, as part of the sort of observation and discovery, yep. can yep. identify that and, and, and alert I mean, not, alerts maybe not the best word, but yeah. but at least inform yeah. the data engineering team, yeah. that, and then and then if they like, yeah. presumably someday the AI can take action. Yep. Yep. Because yeah. you could have uh, a customer in many different source systems, and they are all silos of data. Now, through the use of an LLM and doing the semantics, uh, the the distance search, you can find all these correlations and. Uh, similarities across various different systems, extract that into a semantic yep. layer, yep. and then do data quality Bloody. on it. Yep. Is that? Yeah, yeah, uh, kind of, because I think, uh, I think you cannot look into a one specific table or multiple columns within a table. You need to have a overarching view across all your fields and all your data that's coming in, hmm. right? A file that does not drop in a data like ADLS, ADLS may be the contributing factor for something else downstream. Uh, so there could be a lot of uh, depending in the practice that could be, so having that overall semantic layer, yeah. observing, measuring, and right. then uh, using that knowledge to make decisions yeah. definitely will help in the remediation so aspect the, of it. Although there is always a uh, dark cloud inside the silver <laughs> lining. <laughs> <laughs> and the dark, dark cloud, cloud is that when you have multiple, like LLMs can go and find these relationships, but when you've got these silos of data, they may have inconsistent information. Well, guess what? That inconsistent information is, is now going to surface up yep. in, in the semantic layer. And it's got to be harmonized. Yep. Yes, it needs yep. to be harmonized and somebody needs to clean it yep. because, uh, because LLM won't know. Yeah. Uh, which one is more recent, yeah. therefore for it, I've got two inform pieces of information that seem to be related, but then they're giving me, giving opposite uh, uh, values, and which means uh, y the LLM is going to hallucinate. So the catalog wars are actually a good thing yeah. for your business, <laughs> so let's sort of good explore thing. that a little bit. So <laughs> what's happening is the, I, we talked about this earlier, the point of control is shifting from the database management system Correct. to the catalog, but the point of value is leapfrogging the catalog because yeah. the catalog is getting commoditized. Everybody's yeah. open sourcing. You got Snowflake o open sourcing uh, Horizon, which is uh, really Polaris. the, uh, uh, sorry, Pol Polaris, which is yeah. the technical yeah. metadata. Yeah, the, 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 the operational and business yeah. metadata is, yeah. is still inside in Horizon. So, okay, so there's a hybrid model there. Uh, and uh, then uh, Unity. The Databricks. Kind of open sourced on stage, <laughs> Matei pushed a yes. button, and did Apache <laughs> yeah, 2.0 uh, with, with, uh, with the Unity catalog. Of course, Amazon has yep. you know, its version. Well, yep. uh, Microsoft with Purview is trying to be a catalog of catalogs and add value mm -hmm. on top of that. So how do you see all this, and what, where do you see uh, your firm yeah. you know, adding value in this whole equation? I think, uh, I don't see catalog as a uh, competition, to be honest. No, I think, sure. uh, and then uh, I see also the major technology players like uh, AWS, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google, and then also uh, Databricks, Snowflake, all the creating their own catalogs or even quality and observability. But I think the problem is, uh, I haven't seen one customer landscape where they just pick only one technology vendor. 
uh, and they don't stick to it, uh, even though it may be uh, uh, some cases beneficial, but I don't see that happening. Uh, so you always have a mix of technologies in a landscape that you go, and then it becomes like Snowflake is very limiting. It cannot go beyond that. Uh, I don't see them pushing beyond their Snowflake landscape and they would probably stay there. And that's where the value of a platform like us comes in because we don't, uh, like if you go SAP, then you're not going to be able to use Snowflake. Uh, so I, I think it's it, changing though. Interesting, yeah. yeah. If they don't yeah. if they don't extend beyond Snowflake, and yeah, then I somebody else is going to win yeah. the semantic layer war and then yeah. they could get, <laughs> but they could I, get I, commoditized. I think, I, I think it is changing though. Like yeah. uh, I see these, uh, vendor specific catalogs are now have connectors to SAP and Salesforce and right. so so they know that just being in their own domain will uh, will not cut it because then there'll be niche only for that product. Yeah. So I think I think it's just more the focus too, right? I think that's first point. The second point is like Snowflake as a platform versus DQ Labs as a company that is focused on quality and observability alone right. or anything towards improving the quality from an end to and life cycle is very different, right? All I'm looking at is a glass of water while they're looking, trying to look at across the ocean. So their benefits and features would be very shallow versus where we are doing very focused. Uh, so that's kind of how I see it. Uh, but I think uh, to answer your question, I think there, from a cataloging standpoint, I understand, I agree, it's more of a reactive solution, even with the active metadata and all that stuff. You're always taking a effort that is uh, needs to uh, take a while to get the mm -hmm. data in and all that stuff. And I think this is where a catalog plus quality and observability, all this will converge into one single platform of some sort. Uh, there is no other way uh, in this market because uh, you need some of this information and in catalog. You need some of this quality observability metrics to make the catalog even more valuable. And how do you leverage each other will become into this convergence. Mm -hmm. And that's what we started when we looked into it. We don't want to look quality or observability. We want to look the end-to-end -end data lifecycle from a business outcome standpoint. How do we? How can we improve the data quality? Uh, and that's not an easy problem to solve. Right. <laughs> then you kind of start putting all these different capabilities, school of thoughts, technologies, and together. So I think there will be more convergence to come. So two things are very clear from our discussions with hmm. customers. One is open table formats yes. uh, yeah. are something that customers want. They 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 want to go beyond separating compute from storage. They want to be able to bring any engine to mm -hmm. their data in an open mm -hmm. format. They want to control their own data, number one. Number two is they don't know how to govern it and create data quality across yeah. all their data estates. It's very clear hmm. uh, that, that, that uh, to your point, Roger, yep. no one system is going to rule them all. Yep. So they're going to be they're just creating more stovepipes. So they yep. need a solution like yep. this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, so are you, then uh, it partners with those platforms? Yeah, we are, how we have, we we are partners with Snowflake, yeah. we are partners with Databricks, we mm -hmm. are partners with SAP and uh, all of those things. I think, uh, I think the more uh, these vendors do more of this innovation actually helps more uh, us because uh, the more data that they provide Hmm. then we don't have to go create queries and create more conceptions. Uh, so it will be there. So today's Snowflake usage schema gives us more with the Polaris and Horizon and Cortex and all of those things coming in. If they give more of this information, then we get it right away. Hmm. And so it makes our work less, but then also now we can really focus on the value chain of sort. How do we use this information? How do we uh, combine it with the semantic layer? How do we make it more valuable? How do we uh, put a data point from Snowflake and compare it to something that may be happening in SAP or the files that landing in ADLs. So these are the things that allows us to do it by doing so. Where are you as a company? I'm just looking up on Crunchbase now. We are um, like in the, as in uh, location wise or? No, as in, I mean, uh, just in terms, of, in your in terms of, yeah, raise, yeah. how yeah, much money have you raised? We are a pre-series A company. Uh, we have uh, raised well over like six to eight. Uh, but I think the focus is not about raising. I think today in a, we are living in a generation of like raising money and everyone talks about we are valued this and valued that, but I think we want to focus more on the customer use cases and the outcomes. So for us, more customers, yeah. more wins, more value. Well, the, the reason I ask is people want to know, how do you how you start the company? How do you fund right. the company? No, so, I, so I, I organically yeah. started, yeah. yeah so you funded it yourself? I funded myself, uh, uh, so yeah. so I also had a uh, services company and so I was- 
able to take some cash from it and yeah. put it. And so the fallacy in Silicon uh, Valley is the more money you raise, the higher is your profile. Yeah. Actually, you pay that money down the road. Yeah. So I think what DQ Labs is doing is very interesting because yeah. uh, because you have OEM relationships yep. also. Yeah, so we have uh, <coughs> Hitachi uh, 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 is uh, taking DQ Labs as Pentago. Uh, Pentago. And yeah, globally. Yeah. We, know Pentago. Uh, we also have another relation with Quest Sherwin. Uh, so there is oh, multiple. Fantastic. Uh, and, uh, Irwin. Yeah, Quest Irwin. And so they use us as a DQ for their data intelligence platform. Yeah. And uh, we do have significant other partnerships. So I think uh, for us, I think the goal is not valuation or raising money. Of course, it's critical and it's needed at different points of junction, but not something to be talked about it, but more about how do we solve the problems and how do we win yeah. this. And, uh, so from the start, I've been very focused on that use cases and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think we both have talked about it's all great. those things. It's a very yeah. non-traditional way to, it, to start a company in yes. California. Correct. Right, you go, Correct. Uh, the OEM deals are fantastic, yeah. right? Because yep. they can drive some cash flow. And, yep. Yep. Uh, if you can self-fund it and, and to stay private as long as you can or stay yep. self-funded yeah. as long as you can, it's, yeah. it's, you'd it's, be it's more successful outcome. down the road. Yeah, again, yeah. the goal is not to stay private or there's at some point it makes sense a lot to raise. Yeah. But I think the problem we are solving is not an easy problem, to be honest. So I think like raising a lot of uh, cash and then trying to solve within a one year period and putting a higher valuation actually creates more pressure and takes away the focus from the product and then puts into trying to do something that we cannot do within a shorter period of time. So, so we, that we have been able to have the luxury of some sort in ways. The failure rates, um, many people don't know this, but the failure rates of series A, B, and C companies, hmm. you would think they decline the more mature you get. They don't. They don't. 70% of A, B, and C companies fail. And also, <laughs> like have an exit, lately like the last five, outcome. 10 years, if you see the amount of companies which go series A from seed within a year is enormous. Yes. Right? Like uh, the whole A, B, C has changed. So, in terms so the, the whole idea that getting funded is a badge of honor is, uh, is not correct. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think it's a critical step yeah. that needs to be achieved based on your yeah. cash flows and all I this stuff. People, but yeah, but not not something like a proud moment to be like yeah. because that's where your step zero starts, and then you have more to do, and then you're also committing to some goals right. that you're committing based on timelines and things. And etc. I, I think the point is that VCs are very good at making money for their <laughs> LPs. Yeah. They're not very good, and they're, they're, they're terrible it. at creating successful companies. Their, their, their track record is 70% failure for A, B, and C, so, yeah. so it's a different but perspective. By, and and yeah. by design, right? Because by design, exactly. Yeah. Design, yeah. If, yeah. I'm not saying that's just the wrong strategy if you're Correct. a VC or an LP, right. yeah. you know, but if you're an entrepreneur, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, yeah, but beware. Uh, I also <laughs> see lots of entrepreneurs kind of like uh, get into this uh, chasing, raising money every day. Like, oh, we are, uh, we are not having any income and revenue coming in, so let's go raise money. Right. So it just becomes like a kind of addict of some sort, but then you're kind of like losing away the focus of solving the problem. So for me, uh, I always want to solve the problems. I want to build a good product, a product that lasts and speaks volume. And so uh, raising fund is critical, but not the focus. Well, Raj, c congratulations and best of luck to you. Really <laughs> yeah. appreciate it. Thanks so Thanks. much for coming Thank on the you Thank you so much. So much. All right, for Sanjeev Mohan, uh, Dave Vellante, this is the Cube at, M at, at, sorry, I almost said MIT. No longer <laughs> MIT, CDO IQ from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Right back after this short break.